A very pleasant good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to reach you with this greeting wherever you're located and whatever your time zone is. This is Rita Gadi and welcome to our Chronicles. Few things in our lives limit us more profoundly than our own beliefs about what we deserve. And few things liberate us more powerfully than daring to self-expression, broadening it in the stories we tell. And stories are what make our, make our lives. Nations and peoples are largely the stories that they feed themselves. If they tell, or if we tell ourselves stories that are lies, then we suffer the future consequences of those lies. If we tell ourselves stories that face our own truths, then we free ourselves from our own history for future flowerings. So that is why today I will tell you several stories. But first, before I go into that, we will lead on those stories to the title of our program, Ferdinand Romualdez Marcos Jr. You all know him as BBM, Bong Bong, or whatever else uh, he is more popularly known. So let me first tell the story of who I am so that we can connect the credibility that I have and so far as talking about the Marcos family is concerned uh, however briefly it may have been in the past, but at least that will establish my connection. Because a lot of people know my name, as I said, uh, working in media, Channel 4, the government television channel. And that was how I have been well perceived and known from 1972, 73, 74 until 86 and then thereafter until this date. Okay, so let me begin from 1965. I come from a place in Mindanao known as, then at the time, a third-class municipality. It has given birth to three other towns, as a matter of fact, but at the time, Hidapawan, which is now the capital of North Cotabato, was just a small town. And we also are aware of the fact that Cotabato province was the largest province in the whole of our country. It has now been divided into five other provinces. That's how big it is. Well, my father was mayor of Kidapawan. He was, uh, well, he is a doctor, a general surgeon, together with my mother, who's also a doctor. They settled in Kidapawan and they established their own little clinic. It's called Clinica Gadi, as a matter of fact. So they had um, well, practically uh, patients from all the neighboring towns because the travel, we were actually in the center. If you travel from Kidapawan, you go to Davao City, the, those are where the bigger hospitals are. And then from going, going down further south to Cotabato City, where the other hospitals are. So a lot of people came to Kidapawan because, uh, well, not other towns have doctors who were surgeons. So that was the vast expanse of my dad's influence. And then he entered politics, uh, believing that uh, his limited uh, help to the people was not just in the medical profession, but he could also help in other things. So he was mayor of Kidapawan. Now that was in 1965, he was the nationalista chairman of Cotabato, the province of Cotabato. And under him, he had 10 delegates or 10 mayors that would represent their respective areas in the national convention that will be held in Manila for the Nacionalista Party's choice of who will be the running president, who, who the president will be the candidate. There were four candidates in the Nacionalista Party at the time, we must remember, or perhaps you would 
realized in history that the chairman of the Nationalista Party was the grand old man, as they call it, uh, who was uh, in Ige, I'm sorry. Um, and he was the one who actually chose the candidates, Rodriguez. Okay, so he chose the candidates together with several other of the elders of the Nationalista Party, and they were up for um, a convention a national convention of all the delegates coming from the different provinces of the country. There was uh, Tolentino, Puyat, uh, Pelaez, Lopez candidates for the presidency. President Marcos, I mean, Marcos at the time was Senate president, but he was in the Liberal Party. He thought that just Dado Macapagal, who was the incumbent president, would be supporting him for the presidential elections. But then, just Dado Macapagal decided to run for re-election. So, wala nang posisyon si Marcos sa Liberal Party for the, for the uh, election for the presidency. And that is why he opted to transfer to the Nationalista Party. But among Rodriguez, the grand old man of the Nationalista Party, refused to have any body uh, disturbed already the candidates that were set for the convention. So a lot of, uh, well, maraming, ang tinatawag nga doon, maraming lumapit sa kanya, si Marcos, Liberal Party, talagang outstanding um, candidate yan kasi maganda yung kanyang record as a legislator, pero ayaw ni Amang. So Marcos was brought to Senator Roy, he was senator at the time, Senator Roy, who was the uh, Secretary General of the Nationalista Party. Diyan sa bahay ni Senator Roy sa Broadway. Andyan pa yan hanggang ngayon, uh, refurbished and rebuilt, pero andyan pa yung old house. So doon siya dinala ni um, Senator Laurel para, mag, uh, para lumipat from the Liberal Party to the Nationalista Party. He, he took his oath there the one sa bahay ni Senator Roy. Okay, so that was the situation at the time and that is why the first Marcos I met was Imelda Romualdez Marcos. <laughs> at the time, excuse me, she was the uh, Senate President's wife. She came to our family home in Tomas Morato. At the time, it was called Sampaloc Avenue. Our house is the house on the hill. Kapitbahay namin yan, sila Morata, sila Dr. Delgado, and several others, sila Mr. Reyes, and all. Kung iilan lang, ang andyan sa Sampaloc Avenue noon, our old family home was there. It's, 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 as a matter of fact, they call it the house on the hill. Wala na yan ngayon. Nabenta na yon at uh, ang, ang nakatayo dyan ngayon is that uh, tall condominium, kung saan naman, isang unit doon, doon nakatira, Si Vice President Robredo. But anyway, uh, ano yan? Malayo na sa story ako. <coughs> Excuse me. So Mrs. Marcos, a Senate President's wife, came to our family home in order to talk to my father and to convince him that the 10 delegates of the Nationalista Party from Cotabato, which he is, um, which is with him, will be voting for Marcos in the National Convention. At the time, my father was already committed to heal Puyat, katukayo nga daw niya and all. So uh, Mrs. Marcos uh, was there at the uh, lanai, the, the front lanai of our home. She was together with Marichu Vera Perez. Marichu's father was my godfather sa Binyag, Dr. Pingot Reyes. Uh, Ninong Pingot, I was called Jose Perez. Uh, he, the, their family was close to our family because the father of my mother, Jose Bagtas, was their lawyer when they were setting up some Pagita pictures. Anyway, so so she, uh, Mrs. Marcos and Maricho came to our family home to talk to my father. My father refused to come down. She, he was upstairs in the bedroom. And uh, he was telling me, hindi ako pwedeng mag-commit kasi committed na ako kay Hill Puyat at magagalit si Amang, you know, and all that. So she waited. And during her waiting, kami nagkwentuhan. That was uh, the time that she told me the story of how Marcos is, uh, you know, uh, 
graduated with high honors, top siya sa bar, etc. And that the future of our country and the and uh, of our, the Philippines and the government will be better served by somebody as brilliant uh, as pres as Marcos, who was Senate President. So marami siyang kwento. And then through the stories, she also asked me uh, what I was doing. So I said, uh, patapos na ng college. No, as a matter of fact, tapos na ng college. Uh, major in philosophy, etc. And then she said, she had not major in history. So I got to know her by her stories. She was telling the story of uh, Ferdinand Marcos, who was Senate President, and herself. You know, so uh, her life in Tacloban, her life in Manila, etc. But she was more concerned with how to convince my father, waiting for two hours. So finally, my father said, Sige na nga. So he came down. Incredible as it may sound, after 15 minutes of Mrs. Marcos talking to my father, he agreed that the 10 delegates that he was carrying from Cotabato will pledge their support and their votes for the national convention, which was being held at the Manila Hotel of the Nationalista Party for the presidency of the party. So that was my first encounter with a Marcos, and that was Imelda Romualdez Marcos. Uh, briefly, well, I was also at the Manila Hotel when there was voting, etc. and all. But, you know, by some strange coincidence, or you would call it some synchronicity of the universe, nagkatay sa voting. So, Mrs. Marcos decided to go to church to pray. Anahila niya ako. And, uh, and then, of course, Maricha and several others. So, we went to Baclaran, sa Redemptorist Church doon, to pray. Naglakad siya ng paluhod. Kasi nagkaroon ng tie sa voting, sa, sa convention. Uh, well, anyway, so just to make it, uh, just to make our story short. So anyway, the, the second voting, nanalo si Marcos. 777 nga. You see the, the magic number of how it was. So he was now proclaimed as the uh, candidate of the Nationalista Party for the presidency that year, 1965. and. Um, as a matter of fact, I think I even joined somebody to fetch uh, Nana Sepa, as they would call her, the mother of the president, bring her down to be on stage when they make the announcement and the balloons were all being prepared. As much as I can remember, it was a very festive, you know, and I can remember also that uh, Manila Hotel could not supply, so Winter Garden, the opening ng kung saan meron convention, could not supply as much uh, meals and food Kasi ang daming delegates, ang daming mga hangers on, and of course, ang daming tao na kailangan pakainin. And there was a there was a barge that uh, parked at the back of the Manila Hotel, the sa Winter Garden. And then people were shouting, oh, ayan na, ayan na yung pagkain na dala ni Beho. I thought Beho was some Chinaman from Chinatown, not realizing that Beho is the younger brother of Mrs. Marcos. And he was the one who supplied uh, the food regularly for the delegates who were meeting in at the Manila Hotel. So you see, in sinasabi ng synchronicity because one of his sons, Alfred Romualdez, who's now the mayor of the Cloban City, also became one of my closest friends to this day. So anyway, yun ang, yun ang situation doon. So Marcus made it to the convention and run under the Nationalista Party. And so we had the campaign that was, uh, well, at the time, talagang practically, hindi house to house, but town to town or city to city or province to province, as much as you could stretch, you know, the uh, the campaign trail. So what they did was they gathered several towns in one place para isang rally na lang and so forth. In some of them, my father brought me along. I have a map of the Philippines and on that map, I drew the uh, the trail Kung saan kami nagpunta from, from north to south, from Mindanao all the way up to the north, Visayas, etc. And for every province, sinulat ko rin yung mga pangalan ng mga, yung mga na-meet na, doon, mga politicians, big names. Uh, someday perhaps I could show you that map kasi you will see that the family names that I wrote there are still the family names of the some politicians that are still politicians to this day. So parang Yung sabi nga, uh, parang na minamana, yung, whatever it is. So that was how I got exposed. 
to uh, both uh, Imelda Marcos and President Marcos, the young Ferdinand Romualdez Marcos Jr., or the Bong Bong at the time, was still the young boy. You would see his picture and the vision and the and the visuals of the uh, inauguration, the proclamation, and oath taking of his father at the Luneta. He was about eight years old at the time. So, wala pa kung talagang contact sa kanya except that I would see him in San Juan, which is the family home of the Marcoses, and uh, they had this balcony where Marcus would address the people in the gardens, and that balcony is still there. Inayos na yung bahay na yan, maganda na ngayon, etc. But you still have that balcony because I think not only for nostalgic reasons, but that was where he's, he, he began talking to a lot of followers, a lot of, uh, well, all the people that went there sa, sa kanilang bahay. So that was where I would see the young uh, Bong Bong Marcos running around. Pero hindi siya, hindi sila parating, uh, ano, kasi ang daming tao. So, after, uh, well, that was the campaign, 1965. You remember that when Imelda was talking to me, uh, when she was waiting for my father, she asked me uh, what I intended to do after college. So I said, I'll probably take up postgraduate studies and probably get married. Kasi yung panahon namin, our time during that time was, pagka graduate ng college ng isang babae, eh, kailangan mag-asawa na, you know? Kung hindi, old maid na ang tawag sa'yo. So the next thing is after college, uh, you will be get, getting married. But I still wanted to go for postgraduate studies. And so she told this to uh, the Senate President Ferdinand Marcos and said, Sirita, ikakasal and all that. So my so he told my father, when she gets married, I want to be also the godfather. So si Marcos naging ninong ko, the first wedding of his first term as president. I got married March 5, 1965. Kaya yan siya naging ninong ko kasama ni Dr. Pingot Perez at ni Lucas, George Lucas Adamson. Yung mga ninong ko rin sa binyag ko, sila rin na nagninong dun sa aking kasal. Uh, sumingit naman yung kaibigan naman ng aking uh, asawa, yung Baltazar from Pangasinan. Kaya si Conrado Estrella ang kanilang inimbita, also from Pangasinan. So yun ang manging, mga naging ninong ko. My, the, the ninangs were the, the sisters of my father, who were also my god, my ninangs during, the, during my baptism. So kaya masasabi ko na yun ang, yun ang unang kontak ko na katabi ko si Ferdinand Marcos dun sa kasal ko at the wedding. Uh, where he was asking me, ano bang trabaho niyang magiging pangasawa mo, etc. and all. And during the reception, the reception was held at the Madrid restaurant. Uh, many of you will not even remember this who are listening to me, but the oldies like me, mga 80 anos kagaya ko ngayon, would know Madrid restaurant was one of the best classy restaurants. At may nagsabi nga na paborito daw yan ng first couple. So dun, he, dun yung reception. As a matter of fact, my, my mother-in-law, when she heard that uh, Marcos and Imelda wanted the reception at Madrid, eh, sabi nga ng mother-in-law ko, ay hindi na ako makakabiyahe, malayo yata yun. Because she thought Madrid was in Spain. Anyway, so that was the reception and that was the first time that I sat beside Ferdinand Marcos Sr. at the wedding. He marched, by the way, uh, from, the, from the door of St. Francis Church here all the way up to the altar. He knelt down together with all the sponsors. We talked briefly in between the in between the priests saying all the uh, prayers for the marriage, etc. and all. So as a matter of fact, uh, General Ver was still a colonel at the time. He was the one who was uh, arranging my 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 gown, my train, uh, the train, ang tawag dito. Mahaba kasi yung train ng aking a bridal gown. Incidentally, the bridal gown was sewn by Pitoy Moreno, who was a classmate and good friend of the younger sister of my mom. So, talagang intertwined yan. So, that was it. Colonel Ver at the time um, was the one who was fixing my train para hindi matapakan sa likod kasi following was, of course, the president, Ferdinand Edralin Marcos. Anyway, that was my first encounter with the Marcoses. 1965, etc. My father, 
refused to accept any position. In spite of the fact na 10 delegates ang nahatag niya, you know, during the convention, he did not, he opted to stay in Kidapawan. Kasi sabi nga niya, uh, I will run again against the Muslim lords. The Muslim lords non were the liberals. Si Dato Udtug Matalam, who was the governor, and then the congressman, the lone congressman, kasi one, one district lang ang Cotabato nun, was sa Lipada Pendato, who eventually became senator. So the three highest uh, officials of the liberal party, Osmeña, uh, Pendaton, Rashid Lukman, and all, all liberals. So yun, ang sabi ng, ng daddy ko, sabi ni Dr. Gadi, Okay, Marcos, let me stay in Kidapawan so that I can run again for a higher office and challenge the uh, aristocracy here of the Muslim leaders. Kasi nationalista na yung presidente, nanalo na si Marcos, etc. So doon na lang daw siya sa Kidapawan. So he did not uh, accept any position offered and he stayed as mayor and then eventually, well, this is another history of him running for just about any position that he can challenge the liberal leaders of our province. So that was then. Now, what happened after that? And how did I get into the Marcos uh, coverage of Malacanang and the First Lady? At yan, konektado na rin yan, dadating na tayo dyan sa um, Ferdinand Romualdez Marcos Jr. Okay. So, I was uh, filling up my scholarship at the Philippine Center for Advanced Studies at the University of the Philippines, when Mrs. Marcus was going to have this international conference on the survival of humankind. And um, scientists, maybe about 54 of them or so, were invited to discuss the future of our world. And so they wanted the, uh, the documents and the literature and the narratives of this uh, scientist because these were mga taganasa, mga tungkol sa mga remote sensing, etc. about agriculture, basta mga, mga ano ito, mga mga galing na scientists. They wanted to have uh, all of their, all of those papers to be edited and reduced to common language na kung pwede isang one sheet of paper lang para madaling i-distribute kung ano yung pag-uusapan. Now, Mrs. Nakpil, Chitang Nakpil, Tita Chitang as I would call her, was the one who told Mrs. Marcos, well, we can get Rita at the time. Uh, she can, she, she's a fast reader and she can do editing. So that was how uh, I was brought, brought to the Philippine International Convention Center. I was given a room. I had to go over the documents and I had to edit them so that pwedeng badaling basahin. And then they wanted uh, a television program to interview the scientists. Again, Tita Chitang nagpil said, si Rita, kasi kilala na niya eh, yung sinulat nito mga scientists na ito, so she can be the one to interview them. So that was my first exposure to media. Remember, my major was in philosophy, my postgraduate was in cultural anthropology, so walang connection yan sa media at the time. Anyway, so she told me, punta ka sa Channel 4, dyan sa Intramuros building, and you will host that program on the habitat, on, on, on the survival of humankind. So that was how I had my first exposure sa television. My first director was Patsy Monson, kapatid ni Ms. Tina Monson Palma. And uh, she had really to, well, she had to coax me over so many things kasi hindi ko alam talaga how to move about uh, sa, in front of a television camera. So that was how I got into television discussing the uh, survival of humankind with the scientists on Channel 4, which is a government television station in Intramuros pa. Wala pa sila dyan sa Bohol Avenue. And then, the uh, the one assigned to cover the office of the president in Malacanang was Vera Perfecto, a tall, handsome, booming voice of a man who was, uh, you know, an expert in handling uh, high-profile personalities. Siya yung nagko-cover ng Malacanang for Channel 4. He suddenly died of a heart attack. So the IMF was already scheduled very, uh, you know, soon. Uh, and then I was told that I would be covering the IMF and then also to be assigned 
in Malacanang to take the place of Vera Perfecto. So to make it short, dyan ako na kapasok ng Malacanang, nakita yung first family, nakita si um, Bongbong Marcos, uh, lumalaki na, nag-aaral sa Lasal, etc. Still, we did not have any uh, personal contact at the time. He was part of the first family. And you know, uh, report. And I was not a reporter. I was assigned, I had a consultancy for the coverage of the Office of the President and the IAN. Parang consultancy yon, hindi yon reporting. Ba, ikikwento ko kung anong nangyayari on live coverage yon. So that was how it was, my exposure to them. Be that as it may, um, mabilis na panahon ang nangyari, yung mga bata after their studies in La Salle and the, and the girls in Assumption, etc. Pinadala na abroad because martial law was going to be declared and there could be some risks involved kung sakaling magkaroon ng gulo, etc. So yung mga bata, like Ferdinand Marcus Jr. was sent abroad. After La Salle, doon na siya nag-aral uh, abroad. I, have no con I had no contact with them while they were studying. Miss Aini was also sent abroad hanggang sa nag, uh, nakatapos sila ng uh, tertiary, tertiary, secondary studies, hanggang nag-college, etc. So kung ano man ang pinag-aralan ni Ferdinand Romualdez Marcus Jr., ay na, may record naman yan. We know the several uh, disciplines that he enrolled in. Ang dami-daming pintas na kasi siya hindi nakatapos. Kasi, but he had certificates for all the disciplines that he entered into. You must remember that it is not easy to get into this Ivy League uh, colleges and universities. So there there has to be some degree of excellence and some degree of uh, of knowledge and intelligence for him to qualify and for him to finish at least those subjects and receive a certificate for them. So that was his school life. And then when he came home, his first uh, entrance into politics was vice governor dun sa probinsya ng kanyang ama. I am I am relating this now, leading on to the story that is leading on to Bongbong Marcos, the junior. So nag vice governor siya. Ayan. Uh, did we hear very much about him, about his vice governorship? Alam naman natin pagka vice president ka, vice mayor ka, vice governor ka. Iba naman ang palakad ng ng uh, administration at ng management. So he was in charge of the provincial council, if that is the way. It was going on at the time. So not very much did I know about his uh, political uh, life at the time when he was vice governor. But this is where I think you and I must be able to recognize this particular image when he was already vice governor, when all these things that were happening at the EDSA was occurring and the and the visual that we saw at the balcony of Malacanang was Ferdinand Marcos Jr. naka-uniforme ng sundalo. Nakatayo, seryoso ang kanyang tingin, nakaharap sa kanyang ama, minsan-minsan tumitingin sa mga tao sa ibaba, ngunit makikita nyo, he was uh, naka-profile in a way, nakaharap sa kanyang ama. I think you must uh, look at that figure of Bongbong Marcos in that balcony. He could have easily worn Barong Tagalog like his father. Naka-Filipiniana sila. His sisters were well in Filipina dress. Hindi. Nakasuot siya ng sundalo. On his own, doon merong statement yan. Defense of the palace and defense of my father. Nakatayo siya doon, nakatingin sa kanyang ama, habang kumanta yung kanyang ina at si President Marcos ay nagdiskurso. I look at that image and that is something that really etched in my map, you know, a, a great significance in my mind. Sapagkat ang tingin ko sa kanya, here is this young boy, this young man, pero tumayo doon to defend the office of the president, the president himself, Malacanang and directly to the country which was at the time precariously uh, you know, on edge with what was happening at EDSA. I do not know how much he was aware of what was happening um, in telephone conversations 
uh, of his father with Paul Laxalt, etc. I am not privy to that. I can only relate the story of what I saw and what I uh, believed was happening at the time. Now, this is another story. Sabi ko nga, sa aking mga kinekwento, kinakailangan, andun ako. Nakita ko, nadinig ko, at alam ko ang nangyayari first hand. Hindi ito uh, hearsay, hindi ito kinwento sa akin. Andun ako. So, andun ako, nakita ko siya, andun sa balkonahe. Okay. One incident, nung nasa loob na ang first family, at si President Marcos andun sa study room, there was an incident there na may nangyari. Hindi ko alam kung merong nagsulat nito o may nagkwento nito o kung lumabas ito sa mga pahayagan. Ngunit sinulat ko ito. Noong 25th year ng anniversary ng tinatawag na nilang EDSA People Power, uh, the, the Philippine Daily Inquirer requested that I write about what happened inside Malacanang during those days na merong kaganapan sa EDSA ng mga dilaw. So I said, okay, I will write about what I know firsthand, but please do not edit. Publish it as is. So doon sa, it, in fact, uh, ano yan eh, um, part one and part two, dalawang, dalawang beses lumabas. Sapagkat, alam mo naman, napaka-quintista ko, ang dami kong storya, hindi nagkasya yun sa, ano, sa first issue. In fact, nasa front page yan, inside Malacanang, yun, ako yun, nagsulat nun. Doon ko kinwento ang nangyari, na ngayon ay sinasalaysay ko sa inyo. And this is a story where uh, I have to relate because that is how I saw Ferdinand Romualdez Marcos Jr. Nung bumagsak yung unang bomba sa Malacanang, Takbuhan lahat ng mga security, pumasok sa study room. Gumalaw yung mga chandeliers, gumalaw, nagyanig sa sahig, andun din ako. So sabi ng security, ma'am, takbo na sa loob. So I run together with them inside the study room. We were huddled there. Hindi ko na alam kung nasaan yung si Mrs. Marcos at ano, siguro nasa ibang kwarto doon. Ngunit andun si Presidente, President uh, Edralyn Marcos uh, uh, seated sa kanyang desk. Bong Bong Marcos together with some members of the Presidential Security Command went to look for the uh, for where the bomb fell. Dalawa palang bomb ba yun? Where, where the bombs fell. So siya ang nagsabi sa kanyang ama yun na dinig ko at nakita ko. Sabi niya, let me look. Let me see if we can find the shrapnel and ano, kung, ano yun, kung saan bumagsak. So it took a while until he came back. Hawak niya at hawak ng mga ibang kasamahan niya na sa Presidential Security Command yung shrapnels. And then he said, Dad, these are not issued by our uh, army. And then he read, United, made by the United States of America. Yeah. So, Marami siguro hindi nakaalam. Ngunit siya ang lumabas ng Malacanang para hanapin kung saan nahulog ang bomba. Ganon katapang siya doon sa moment na hindi siya nagkubli, hindi siya nagtago, hindi, hindi pumunta sa ilalim ng kama, kagaya nung may nangyaring nakaraang ganon. At siya, kasama ng mga sundalo, ang naghanap at tiningnan kung saan bumagsak yung bomba na yon. I relate this as the story of a man who was not afraid. A young man who took uh, the responsibility for, for the rest of the soldiers there, of the PSE, and for his father, and for the country. Kasi office of the president yan na binomba. So, that is the story I have to tell firsthand without any elaboration. Pero there at that moment, I saw how brave he was and how he took the responsibility immediately of finding out ano ba itong tinapon dito sa office of the president na nag, yung binomba dito. 
zone. That particular incident is part of the story that I'm telling now about this man, Bongbong Marcos, Marcos Jr. The other image I would want you to remember and also imprint in your minds, Citizen Marcos, nung binabasa eroplano at nilatag sa tarmac yung 44 slain soldiers, the SAF, Special Action Forces. Hindi siya nakabarong, hindi siya nakasuot sundalo, ordinaryong suot na inikot niya at binigyan niya. He gave honor to the 44 soldiers na nasawi dun sa Maguindanao. Again, I am connecting these two images together kahit na there was a span of several decades in between sapagkat para sa akin, hindi biro yung tatayo ka dun sa Malacanang para hanapin yung nagbomba sa inyo at ikaw na mismo ang nag, uh, nag-utos na talagang kailangan siya sa atin natin kung ano ito. Ganon din ang ginawa niya. And this was during you know, the administration of those who hated them so much. Anyway, sino-shortcut ko yung dalawa para lang mapakita yung talagang uh, nag-imprint sa akin. It's a story that I will always remember, that I will have to relay a couple of times perhaps in the future for my grandchildren. Anyway, so yun ang ibig kong sabihin na mahalagang tingnan natin itong si Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Pagkatapos niyan, alam na natin ang nangyari. Magbula sa Malacanang, ang sabi ay dadalhin sila sa Ilocos. Alam din niya yan. Ngunit pagdating nila sa Clark, ano ang sinabi ng commander ng Clark? Pinaligiran daw ang Clark Air Base ng mga komunista at kailangan daw alisin, ilipad sila out of Clark. Siya na nga ang namahala sapagkat sinabihan yung mga armas na dala ng security ni President Marcos kailangan iwanan. So he was there all throughout regarding this. Can you imagine what kind of a feeling he must, you know, trying to contain within himself? Na ang kanyang ama, na sabi nga may lagnat at the time, Dinala out of Malacanang sa helicopter, ni landing sa Clark, tapos madaling araw ginising, sinakay sa aeroplano, dadalahin daw sa lawag o sa Pawai, ngunit doon pala sa Guam ang kanilang pagsak. And from Guam sa Honolulu. So he went through all of that. Until they got to Honolulu. At doon sa Honolulu, yung sa kanilang kung saan sila tinira pang kasalukuyan pag landing nila, nilagyan pa yun ng cordon na ribo na dilaw sa labas para hindi daw sila makalabas, hindi, para namang tatakas. Hindi ba? Clark Air Base yan ng mga Amerikano. For whatever that may be worth, napaka- Napakasama ng treatment na ginawa sa kanila pag landing nila doon. And here was this young man, Marcus Jr., watching it all in silence. May nadinig ba kayong nagbitiw siya ng salita? May mga periodista, may mga media, hindi siya nagsalita. He kept this all to himself. Watch his father, watch his mother, watch his sisters. Diyan sila na exile sa Oahu, yun ang island na yon, yung city na yon sa Honolulu. Hanggang sa nakatira nga muna yung sa main avenue ng Honolulu, yung kalanian ni Ole, pagkatapos nalipat na sila sa Makiki Heights. Yan ay isang lumang bahay na may-ari ng mga Marcoses. Kaya minabuti naman na doon na sila patitirahin, doon sa Makiki Heights. Diyan natin nakita na may mga Ang daming, ang daming dumalaw, mga Ilocano, tuwing linggo, nagdadala ng pagkain, lahat na yan. At uh, 
si si Junior andun din paikot-ikot din nakikipagsama sa mga bumibisita ngunit hindi ko na nakita kung ano talaga ang kanyang mga uh, sinabi sa panahon na yon kung ini, meron siya mga interview mapapanood niyo yan um uh, in interview siya kasama ng kanyang ina and listen to what he said my goodness even at that time you will be proud of him sa mga sagot niya sapagkat sa sa bigat ng kanilang dinalang paghihirap na pag-alis sa palasyo, sa treatment na binigay sa kanilang kabastusan, kung sasabihin ko talagang ng Amerikano. Kaya nga nung in-interview ko si President Marcos sa uh, Honolulu, nung tinanong ka, anong tinanong ko siya, uh, did you regret calling for a snap election kasi parang doon nagsimula? Hindi pa nga natatapos yung question ko. Sabi niya, of course not, because I won. So, would there have been any regrets? Alam mong sinagot niya, the betrayal of a friend. Yan, kaibigan niya ang Amerikano. Kaibigan niya si Reagan. Ang dami niyang, anyway, the betrayal of a friend. Iko-connect ko na rin yan sa mga uh, friends niya na tumakwil sa kanya, kaya nga nagkaroon niyang EDSA na yan. Secretary of Defense, si Enrile, tapos pinsan niya. Si General Ramos. And who now sits in Walacanang together with this junior? Juan Ponce Enrile. Na siyang unang-unang nagsalita sa radyo na tinatanggal niya ang suporta kay Ferdinand Edraline Marcos. Si junior, in spite of all of that, and the difficulties and the hardships and the pain and the sufferance that he went through, Kinuha rin niya si Juan Ponce Enrile at dyan niluklok sa Malacanang bilang presidential advisor niya. That is the character of Bongbong Marcos. Kaming mga loyalista, napakahirap na uh, sabihan kami na magrali kay Enrile at the time nung tinanggal siya ni Cory when he was Secretary of Defense. Naalala niyo, kinulong pa yan eh. At sinabihan nga kami, sinabihan kami ng mga tao ni President Marcos sa Hawaii, so, mag, ano kayo, mag-rally kayo, suportahan nyo si Juan Ponce Enrile. Ako parang talagang nagsisikip ang aming dibdib talaga, ang hirap, mayroon ginawa namin sa pagkatiyon ng utos. Pero ito, may nagsabi ba kay Junior na ilagay mo dyan si Enrile? He suffered everything in silence. And in spite of that sufferance that he carried all those years, 37 years, hindi yan biro. Yung taong nagtaksil sa kanila, yan ang kanya ngayon, presidential advisor, dyan, kasama niya sa Malacanang. Anyway, so what is it that we are talking about? Story lang ito eh. Story where I know and I have seen and I have heard. So yan ang buhay nila sa Honolulu. At ano ang ginawa ng Amerika? Kinasuhan. Kinasuhan ng kanyang ama. At kumbaga, hindi lang kanyang ama, but the Marcos. Yan, na isang sindikato na illegal na nagpalakad ng Philippine government at nagnakaw sa taong bayan. Can you imagine how Bongbong Marcos Jr. felt that all over the newspapers, in, in all of media, lahat yan, anong sinasabi? Nagnakaw kayo, nagnakaw kayo. Dinaanan niyang lahat yan until nagka-trial sa New York at nilabas na naman yan. You have there the uh, the mightiest sort of justice, my goodness, uh, accusing them of having stolen money from the people to buy uh, buildings and all of this to have deposits in Swiss banks and that. Ano nangyari? 395 documents, 95 witnesses. Sa araw-araw na diniding uh, pina, uh, that you hear, you have the sessions in court. Every time Marcus Jr. would be there, hindi ba masakit pakinggan? Kagaya nung sinasabi ng prosecutor na babae, si Debra Livingston, ituturo yung daliri sa kanyang ina, nagnakaw kayo sa taong bayan. Hindi ba ang pakiramdam ng isang anak, kaisa-isang anak na lalaki na andun 
naupo, hindi siya naupo kasama namin doon sa harapan, andun siya sa likod, ngunit nakikita niya kung anong pinagsasabi ng prosecution ng Amerika daban sa kanyang pamilya, sa kanyang ama, sa kanyang ina. Anong nangyari? Na-acquit. Not guilty on all the charges, unanimous decision, wala silang nakitang ebidensya na nagnakaw ni isang sentimo sa taong bayan. Kaya, nung in-announce nga yon ng jury, si Catherine Bolton, yung jury spokesperson, at in-announce ng judge, si Judge Keenan, na yung asawa, kaklasi pa ni Corazon Aquino doon sa New York na nag-aaral siya. Can you imagine that? The bias and the prejudice that poured on them. Anyway, takbo siya doon sa kanyang ina, niyapos niya, at nagpasalamat din sa kanyang ama. Ligtas na sila sa buong mundo na pakita wala silang ninakaw. In the same manner din yung human rights, human rights sa Hawaii, na-dismiss na yan ng judge mismo sa Hawaii. Pinasukan na lang ng Amerika na ulitin ulit yung accusation na yan. Yan si Armacos na naging dating ambassador dito, siya nagkulit-kulit sa kanilang court of appeals na buhayin na naman yung human rights niya. But be that as it may, yan na nga ang dinaanan ni Ferdinand Marcos Jr. At bumalik siya sa Pilipinas after the acquittal of his mother at naayos na yung kanilang papeles. Wala na, libre na. They are free now to face the world. Justice has been given to them. Nung nagkaroon ng konting celebration doon sa isang restaurant sa New York nung na-announce yung acquittal, siya ang nagsalita at yun na nga ang sinabi niya. That he respects the justice system of America sapagkat precisely because it is the severest test of the justice system ay talagang hinimay lahat ng accusations against them at libre sila. Doon siya nagsabing maraming salamat din sa Amerika because the justice system works. Nung natapos yon inayos niya ang kanyang pag-uwi. He came home during the administration of Corazon Aquino who together with the PCGG maneuvered all of those cases against them. 980 criminal and civil cases dito na sa Pilipinas ang pinag, ang, ang kanilang, uh, that they filed against them. Can you imagine that? And the PCGG was created as the first executive order of Mrs. Aquino. Executive order number one, number two, number 12, number 12A, at ano yan? Kunin lahat ng alam nila ng mga ari-arian ng mga Marcoses. How did Marcos Jr. suffer through all this? Did you hear anything from him? Did he say anything against all of those machinations, the rampage that they did against his family? He came home. Umuwi siya. Hindi siya natakot na humarap sa korte, sa mga korte ni Mrs. Aquino. Mga inappoint niya ng mga nasa justice system. He did not fear. No, kukulong siya. Wala siyang sinabi, wala siyang press statement na nakakatakot naman. Kailangan dito muna ako sa Hawaii o sa ibang bansa. No, he came home. And then he entered politics again to tell the people na salamat sa inyong pagtaguyod sa amin, kayong mga nagloyalista sa aking ama at sa aming pamilya. Ilang episodes yan, he ran for governor, he ran for congressman, he ran for senator, natalo minsan, tumakbo ulit, run for vice governor until he ran for the presidency. Pero bit-bit niya ang backpack niya, yung 37 years ng paghihirap at yung pagdumi sa kanilang pangalan. And I should mention na doon sa New York kung saan nilalabas lahat yan, na-meet niya yung sa ating First Lady, si Lisa Cacho Araneta. She loved him despite the fact that there in New York, nilatag lahat ng mga kadumihan ng mga Marcoses ng Amerika nilabas doon. She loved him despite that and married him and is now his first lady to this day. Kailangan tingnan natin yan. Ikaw ba? You're, you have a beautiful career. You have a good career in New York, no less. In a law firm na kilala ka na dyan sa, my goodness, New York City pa. Sabi nga, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. And you fell in love with this young man who's 
Ang trial sa New York na lahat ng kadumihan at lahat ng pagnanakaw nilalandlan araw-araw. In fact, there is a publication, The Manhattan Lawyer, you read that every day, at andun, nakaano doon. Of course, Lisa was reading all of this, but despite that, naniwala siya sa katotohanan. Naniwala siya sa karakter nitong Marcos Jr. na ito, na lahat ng pinagsasabi laban sa kanila, hindi ito. Hindi lang niya minahal doon sa New York. Sinagot pa niya, oo, oo. Magpapakasal tayo. And they married. And they're together now as both our president and our first lady. Hindi ko nasasabihin pa kung ano yung mga characteristics, etc. Pero yun na lang. I am just telling the story as I have seen it, at I, as I have heard it, and I have known it personal. Nakita ko yan sa New York. Nakita ko yan pag-uwi ni Marcus Jr. dito. Nakita ko ang pagharap niya sa korte habang andyan pa yung babaeng talagang nagtugis sa kanila. At sa mga subsequent uh, governments after that, which were not friendly to them at all. Kahit nakaibigan la si Erap sabi palilibing na yung tatay tapos umatras. And all of these incidents that have happened from from their friends even, na na, ang aga-aga pa, nag-compromise agreement na. Diyos ko, for 100, 150, I have their compromise agreements. Nag, nakipagkutsaba na sa PCGG. Meron ka bang nadinig na sinabi ni Marcus Jr.? Alam niyang lahat yan, kilala niya sila. Meron ba ka bang nadinig laban sa kanila? So look at the character of this man now and see how he behaves. Itong hidwaan, itong mga sinasabi, ito si ganyan, ganyan, itong pinsa mo ganyan. Kung 37 years na talagang grabe ang batikos sa kanila, sa pamilya niya, wala kang madinig na salita sa kanya. He kept his silence but the language of his silence spoke a million words. In fact, it spoke 31 million votes. That is the president we have today. Remember this as I tell you that story because there are things that we have to remember if we remember the truth, then it will be the beginning of a good future. If we only remember the lies, then that is what we have to suffer for the rest of our history. Kaya sabi ko nga, dalawang image ang aking nakikita dyan. Nung siya ay tumayo doon sa balkonahe ng Malacanang to defend the office of the president, Malacanang, and the country as he stood by his father. At nung siya ay tumayo, pag-recognize sa ating military yung mga sinalakay na special action forces. Sapagkat doon niya pinakita that the foundation of our economic progress and everything else is in the peace and security of our country. Yan ang kanyang katungkulan nung siya ay nag oath of office as commander-in-chief. So nakita nyo yung dalawang pagtayo niya, isang batang sundalo sa balkonahe ng Malacanang bago sila umalis, at yung kanyang pagtayo sa harap ng mga sundalong walang uniforme siya noon. Ngunit yung recognition niya na ito ang nagbibigay sa atin ng, ng tapat na serbisyo para tayo ay protek proteksyonan ang bayan natin, ang ating mga kababayan, the Filipino people, the country, and now, whatever else is being debated upon, all this political quagmire that we're in. Yan, si Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Nakatayo dyan. Tahimik, sabi nga, magsalita ka na, magsabi ka na ng ganito. Remember his silence for 37 years. And as I've said, his, the language of his silence spoke a thousand words, a million votes, 31 million. As a matter of fact. So, marami pang storya na hindi ko siguro na himay na dinaanan niya sa lahat ng ito. Ngunit, sapat na yon Because the stories we tell ourselves is exactly what makes our lives of any value. Yung sinasabi nga, I'd like to, well, I have the book here of Ben Ocker na sinasabi nga that there is a mutual justice to the incontrovertible logic of the way stories reveal their hidden selves. Yan, yan. This is the story I had to tell 
because they tell the story of the hidden cell of this man who stands now as the commander in chief of our armed forces and as the president of our republic. Sa kanyang mga dinaanan, lahat ng kanyang uh, pinasukan sa politika at yung mga yung mga different episodes na yan, they all actually lead on to the two images that I would also want you to remember. I relay the stories because they are the incontrovertible truth that we can see. Hindi na natin mapapalitan yon. Nakaraan na yan. Andiyan na yan. Yan ang katotohanan ng ating simula as a nation. Kaya mahalaga na bigyan natin diin sa ngayon, lalo na sa kalus- kal- salukuyang pagkakagulo. Lahat ng sinasabi, mag-resign ka, itong gawin mo lahat. Sino ba tayo para magsalita habang siya ay nakaupo dyan at alam niya? Kung alam niya, ang kan- kung nabit-bit niya sa kanyang loob at sa kanyang puso, lahat ng kanyang dinaanan for the past 38 years, I do not know of any other image of any other person that could be have been able to withstand all of this and kept this in silence until now he believes he owes it to the people. Lahat nga nung mga uh, nagpatnubay sa kanila, all of those who have stood by them, he has all of them in their hearts. Oh, ang dami nagtatampo. Ba't hindi na-appoint dito? Ba't hindi na-appoint? Bakit nga si Enri lang in-appoint dyan? Kinwento ko na sa inyo. Yan ang klase ng karakter nitong taong ito. Did he bear any grudges? Nasa loob niya siguro. Hindi niya nilabas. Did he have anger in his heart? Hindi niya nilabas. Ngunit pinakita niya what a statesman is sa lahat ng kanyang episodes na din. Sa Congress, pwede ka magsalita. You are immune from the speeches that you make. Meron ba kayo na dinig na nagbati ko siya? Ano unang ginawa niya when he was congressman? Mindanao ang kanyang anasikaso. Yung bang sa moro. Kasi alam niya, lahat itong mga ginagawa niya ngayon, yung kadiwa, saan ang galing niya? Nanay niya. Anak siya ng nanay niya. Itong tinatawag na, yung sabi nga niya sa infrastructure, build better, more. Build more, better. Saan ang galing yan? Galing yan sa infrastructure din ng kanyang ama. Crisscrossing the country with this pan-Philippine highway, the Marcos Highway, etc. Itong tinatawag niyang digitalization, saan ang galing yan? Sinimulan yan doon, Technolo- Te- Technology Resource Center, University of Life, lahat ng yan to digitalize para mas madali ang pagtanggal ng bureaucratic red tape. Yan, bureaucratic red tape. Sinabi din yan kanyang ama na lahat ng mga notoriously undesirable, alisin na at palitan na. Yan ang kanyang launching. Kamakailan lang, noong linggo lang. Ang bagong Pilipinas, ano ba yan? Magservisyo kayo, huwag kayong nagkukuyakoy dyan. Etc. Etc. Hindi ko na lang maulit pa ng kanyang pinagsasabi dyan. Pero ano yan? Anak ng Marcos. Sinabi ng kanyang ama niya, ng kanyang ama. The Filipino ideology, which has been condemned in so many books, listen to his speeches. They contain the translation of that ideology and that vision into the words that he speaks today. Into the oratorical um, you know, expertise that he has to outline and to make the statements that his own father has stood on and written about. Anak ng Marcos, anak ng Imelda. The tertiary hospitals that he has mentioned, some of them that he already had groundbreaking or inauguration. Ano yan? Yan yung heart center. Yan yung lung center. Sa lung center lang, anong sabi niya? Pwede na magkaroon ng lung transplant. O, oh, nagkaroon tayo ng kidney transplant. What is that? Anak ng nanay niya na nakaisip niya kasama ng mga dalubhasa nung panahon nila. We do not hear those names coming up. Marami na kasing namatay na mga kasama niya noon. As a matter of fact, ilan-ilan na lang ang natitira na buhay pa. And perhaps even in media. Sige, tingnan ninyo, is there any president at all from 1986 and even before that, today, na nakipagkamayan kay Chairman Mao Zedong ng China. My goodness. Andun siya, kasama ng Yang Kina. Ten days in September, sa mga inikot nila na pinakita sa kanila ni uh, Chow Enlai, I'm sorry, uh, Madam Chang, asawa ni Mao Zedong, inikot sila. 
in the future, that young man, yeah, that young boy, ano siya, teenager siya at the time. He was a teenager at the time. When uh, Chairman Mao Chetung acknowledged his presence there, his presence with his mother. Ano yan? Can you imagine that historic moment that this young man who was acknowledged by the chairman of the People's Republic of China is now our president? Kaya ba bang ipagyabang yun? Hindi. Sapagkat yung retrato niya, minsan-minsan lang tinitingnan. Am I proud of it? That is why I am telling this story. It is a story that you must hear. It is a story I have to tell. I have to tell because I was there firsthand, personally, seeing all of this. At lahat ng mga ibang incidents na kinikwento ko nga sa inyo, yung trial sa New York, yung pag-meeting nila ni Miss Lisa at naging first lady, lahat ng yan. I was there. I was present. I heard firsthand. Kaya sinasabi ko nga, kaya nagbigay ako ng kontik background, paano ba ako napagpad dyan? Yun yun. Coming from what was once upon a time, the small town of Kidapawan. I acknowledge also the contribution of my father dyan sa National Convention ng Nationalista Party. With no expectations to be rewarded for that act because he too at that moment, believed in Ferdinand Marcos Sr., as I do now, tell the story of Ferdinand Romaldes Marcos Jr., so you too would believe. So, this has been your Chronicles. If any of you are reacting to this and would like to know other episodes, I still have many stories to tell. But meanwhile, acknowledge the fact that our head of government, the President of the Republic of the Philippines, and the Commander-in-Chief of our armed forces is Ferdinand Romualdez Marcos, Jr. Thank you very much for having joined me. This is Rita Gadi for The Chronicles. Bum, bum, bum. Bum, bum, bum. Bum, bum, bum.